Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 terrifying facts about the Yakuza. Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video contains a ton of Japanese pronunciations. I try to look up the ones I can. They're not always available in the various pronunciation dictionaries, so I apologize to any Japanese people or people super familiar with Japanese before I get started. Please don't give me too much of a hard time in the comments. The Yakuza is the Japanese mafia, and their name essentially means good for nothing. The name is believed to have been drawn from the lowest hand in the Japanese card game, Baccarat, which is similar to Blackjack. In the game, getting the cards Yakuza 893 is the worst possible hand that you can get. Yakuza can refer to the crime syndicate as a whole or to an individual gang member, who are also called Gangu Gangster. In the video today, we've got 10 of the most terrifying facts about these notorious gangsters. Number 10. Irezumi One of the most noticeable ways members of the Yakuza can stick out are their extensive tattoos called Irezumi. Most of the time it covers their entire torso except for a stripe down the middle of the chest. Sometimes it can even cover most of their bodies. The tattoos are designed to be hidden under the clothes and the stripe down the chest allows them to open their shirt collar or wear a robe without revealing them. The tattoo process is expensive, time consuming and utterly painful. They aren't done with electric needles, instead it's performed by hand with a needle made from steel or bamboo. The artist dips the needle in some ink and then repeatedly punctures the skin. The tattoos can sometimes take years to complete. There are several reasons why the Yakuza embraced Irizumi. First, it's expensive, so it shows that they have money. Secondly, it's painful, so it shows the man is tough for sitting through hours upon hours of the process. In recent years, the Yakuza have moved away from getting tattoos because of the public backlash. The Yakuza also generally try to make an effort to blend in. Also, since the tattoos have gone out of favor, there's not so many tattoo artists who can make these tattoos. Number 9. Huge Membership It's tough to determine what exactly is the foundation of the Yakuza, but some experts think that their lineage can be traced back to the gangs of Ronin, which were samurai without masters. Others think that they came from a group of grifters and gamblers dating back to Japan's feudal era. The Yakuza is also not one big group either. It's comprised of several gangs called Borokudan, which means violence groups. As of early 2017, there were 22 recognized groups divided into separate clans. The largest of these groups is the Yamaguchi. Gucci Gumi, who accounts for about a quarter of all Yakuza members. Yakuza membership exploded after World War II. By the early 1960s, there were 184,100 Yakuza members, but that number dropped to around 60,000 for several decades. In the 1990s, they saw a resurgence, and there were about 80,000 members until 2011, when their numbers started to dramatically drop. That's when the Japanese government enacted some new laws to combat the Yakuza by restricting their revenue. In late 2016, their numbers were the lowest since the National Police Agency started keeping records at about 30. 9,100 members. However, this low membership isn't necessarily a good thing. Jake Adelstein, who is a reporter working in Japan and an expert on the Yakuza, told the South China Morning Press that the drop in numbers is probably only temporary. In December of 2016, Japan legalized gambling, and in about five years, casinos are expected to start opening. That's about how long it's going to take former Yakuza members to get a clean record. Adelstein thinks that this will create a lot of opportunities for the Yakuza. They will be able to get reformed gang members into the casino, where they will be able to skim profits or blackmail people who lose big, which will generate huge revenue streams that will, in turn, allow the Yakuza to employ more members. Number 8. The Godfather of Godfathers the most infamous Yakuza boss was Kaozo Taoka, who was the head of the Yamaguchi Gumi. Taoka was born in a small village on the island of Shikoku. He was orphaned at a young age and sent to Kobe, where he worked in shipyards. In 1929, he started to hang out with members of the Yamaguchi Gumi and became a blood member in 1936. During this time, he got the nickname that he'd keep for the rest of his life, Kubo, which means bear. He got this nickname because he had a tendency to claw and gouge out his opponent's eyes. In 1936, Tauka went to jail for slashing a rival gang member to death. He was released in 1943 and found Yamaguchi Gumi in shambles because of World War II. After the war, in 1946, Tauka, then 33 years old, became the leader of the Yamaguchi Gumi after the previous boss died from natural causes. Tauka had an amazing gift for organization and he grew the gang to be the largest in Japan. The Godfather of Godfathers, as Tauka was called, died in July of 1981 at the age of 68. Number 7. Yubitsume 
Yabitsume, which translates to finger shortening, is the act where a Yakuza amputates a piece of his little finger as a way to atone for a mistake or misdeed. This act is either voluntary or not. Often they volunteer as a way to avoid a large punishments like being kicked out or killed, possibly by being forced to commit suicide. It stems from a punishment that was inflicted on gamblers who didn't pay their debts in feudal Japan. Besides causing a lot of pain, it also makes it difficult for a person to handle a sword. If they couldn't handle a sword, they couldn't defend themselves and it would make them more vulnerable. It was adopted by the Yakuza because it might affect them in hand-to-hand -hand combat and while handling guns, so it would discourage members from doing something wrong. There was also a benefit to the Yakuza if their members are weaker because they would need to depend on their boss even more. There are different accounts of how the ritual is done, but what stays the same is that the Yakuza has to do it to himself. One account of the ritual is that it's done while the boss supervises. There is a cloth that is laid flat and the offender places his left hand on the cloth, palm up. Then, using a sharp knife called a tanto, they cut at the pinky and the distal interphalangeal joint, which is the top knuckle. Once that is done, they wrap it up and hand it to the boss. Another version, which was pulled from court testimony, made the act sound a lot less ritualistic. The actual procedure is to take a little silver knife on a table and you pull it towards yourself and bend over and your body weight will snap your finger off. The finger that is severed is put in a small bottle with alcohol and your name is written on it and it is sent to whoever you're repenting to as a sign that you are sorry. In 1993, a government survey found that 45% of Yakuza members were missing part of their little finger and 15% had to perform the act more than once. Yabitsume doesn't happen as often anymore because the Yakuza has been trying to blend into society and missing pieces of your finger is a good way to stick out. Number 6. Tadamasa Goto's Liver Tadamasa Goto is the founder of the Gotogumi, which is a large Yamaguchi Gumi affiliated gang. When he was in power, he was one of the most dominant and successful Yakuza bosses in the country, which is why he was called the John Gotti of Japan. Since Goto was a notorious gangster, he wasn't allowed to enter the United States. This presented a problem for Goto in 2001 because the 59 year old gangster needed a liver transplant. Liver problems are pretty common among the Yakuza because gangsters who run red light districts aren't exactly known for their clean living. Also, their tattoos are so dense that it blocks sweat from exiting their body, meaning fewer toxins leave their body, taking a toll on the liver. Supposedly, liver damage is a sign of pride among the Yakuza. For example, they will say things like, I drank enough to destroy three livers. However, due to restrictive organ transplant laws, transplants are hard to get in Japan. This led to him striking a secret deal where he gave the FBI information on the Yakuza and he donated money to the UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles in exchange for a liver transplant for himself and three of his underlings. The transplant stayed a secret until Jake Adelstein published a story about it in 2008. UCLA claimed that the men each paid $400,000 in cash for their livers and Gotto donated $100,000. $100,000. However, Adelstein uncovered that Gotto and one of the other Yakuza gangsters each paid $1 million for their livers. Also, Gotto would have been number 80 on the waitlist for a liver, but he managed to get a transplant in six weeks. Two other people, including the second person on the waitlist, died in area hospitals around the time that Gotto got his transplant. When the UCLA Medical Center was asked about the transplants on men who were tattooed and missing pieces of their pinkies, they declined to comment. After getting the transplant, Gotto went back to Japan, and he remained the leader of the Gotto Gumi until 2000. In his retirement, he joined the Buddhist priesthood and published an autobiography. This was a bestseller, and his royalties were donated to charity. Number 5. The Yakuza are heavily involved in Japanese politics and the Japanese elite. The Yakuza plays an interesting role in Japanese society. For many years, Japanese society begrudgingly accepted that the Yakuza were part of the culture, so the Yakuza worked out in the open. They are also longtime donors and supporters of the Liberal Democratic Party, LDP, which is a right wing party that has been in power in Japan since 1955, with the exception of five years between 1993 and 1994 and 2009 to 2012. Every so often, a scandal erupts when it's exposed that a politician received money from the Yakuza or one of their business fronts. Many times, it's not enough to ruin a career, and the politician doesn't usually resign. One of the biggest political scandals, though, happened during one of the few years when the LDP was not in power. Instead, the Democratic Party of Japan, DPJ, was in power, and they ran on a platform of cleaning up the government and cracking down on the Yakuza. But then, in October of 2012, the DPJ appointed a man named Kaishu Tanaka as the Minister of Justice. 
It turned out that he was heavily connected to the Yakuza, and the fact that the head of their justice system was mobbed up, well, it shocked Japan. Tanaka resigned a few weeks later. Besides money, another way that the Yakuza helped the LDP is by whipping up support in rural areas. In these areas, the campaign chiefs are Yakuza, who also heads the agricultural cooperative. They are also connected to Yakuza-run construction companies. Many of the rice growers who are part of this cooperative also work construction jobs because they don't make enough from growing rice. Obviously, since people in the area are depending on the Yakuza for work, the Yakuza can be very influential when it comes to drumming up votes for the LDP, who, I feel it's important to mention again, have been in power for 57 of the last 62 years. Number 4. Human Trafficking According to the International Monetary Fund and the United Nations, Japan has the fourth biggest GDP behind the United States, China, and the European Union. They are one of the most technologically advanced societies, and they have some of the lowest crime rates in the world. Their murder rate is only 0.3 per 100,000 people. Despite how advanced and prosperous the country is, Japan has a horrifying human trafficking problem. Since 2001, the US Department of State has released the Trafficking in Persons TIP report, measuring countries on their human trafficking problems and what steps their governments are taking to combat the problem. There are four levels, Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 2 Watch List, and Tier 3. Then there is a category for special cases. Tier 1 countries are the best at handling human trafficking. This includes countries like the United States, Australia, Canada, and many countries in Europe. Japan, on the other hand, has never been ranked higher than a Tier 2 country and dipped to Tier 2 Watch List in the past. Tier 2 are countries whose governments do not fully meet the Trafficking Victims Protection Act's minimum standards, but are making significant efforts to meet those standards. Other Tier 2 countries include Iraq and the Northern Triangle countries, which are El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. The Northern Triangle is the most violent area of the world that isn't at war, and it's on par with Japan in terms of human trafficking. Much of the human trafficking in Japan is handled by the Yakuza. The Yakuza got their start in human trafficking during World War II when they worked with the Japanese Empire to provide comfort women to soldiers. The women were often from South Korea and other countries that were invaded by Japan in World War II. After the war, the Yakuza set up brothels, which were frequented by American servicemen. They also set up sex tourism destinations in East Asia for Japanese men who were earning better incomes after the war and could travel inexpensively based on the strength of the yen. However, in the 1980s, women's groups started to protest sex tourism, so the Yakuza made a change. Instead of men traveling to have sex with prostitutes, they simply brought foreign women to Japan and set up brothels in red light districts. These brothels are still in business and found throughout Japan today. It should also be noted that sex tourism it didn't end, it just changed. The Yakuza now send men out of the country to have sex with children. As for why Japan hasn't cracked down on the Yakuza's human trafficking activities, it probably doesn't hurt that the government that they financially support and campaign for has been in near constant power for 60 years. Number 3. Host and Hostess Clubs in Japan, there are these places called host and hostess clubs, where patrons can come and meet a woman who is called a hostess or a man who is called a host, and they have drinks and converse. However, the host and hostess clubs also have a rather sinister side, as they are either owned by the Yakuza or Yakuza associated. According to Jake Adelstein, what happens is that a woman visits a host club to have a boyfriend experience with one of the hosts. As they drink, the host encourages the woman to keep buying expensive drinks, for which they get a commission. Sometimes the women rack up huge bills, and when they can't pay, the Yakuza may force them to work off their debt, which can be done through prostitution. This can even happen to girls under the age of 18 who are blackmailed or forced into prostitution in order to pay off what they owe. If forcing women, especially teenagers, into prostitution to pay off a bar debt wasn't bad enough, the Yakuza also have a system in place so that the women will never be able to pay off the debt. For example, they'll only be able to work off the interest, or they'll be invited to host birthday parties, and then they are charged money to attend the party, which creates more debt. Essentially, the Yakuza make these women sex slaves because on a night out they spent a bit too much money. Number 2. They are one of the wealthiest organized criminal syndicates in the world. Besides the sex trade, another major source of income for the Yakuza is drugs, especially methamphetamine. The Yakuza reportedly account for one-third of the multi-billion dollar East Asian meth trade. As for how much money the Yakuza organization makes as a whole, that's tough to say because there are so many groups and they are comprised of hundreds of clans. The last figure was from 1989 and it was estimated they were making about 1.3 trillion yen, which is about $10 billion today. There are more recent estimates about how much revenue the biggest group, Yamaguchi Gumi, generates and it's believed to be 
be in the neighborhood of $6.6 billion. This makes Yamaguchi Gumi one of the richest gangs in the world. Number 1. Their Bloodiest War There have been several Yakuza wars over the past several decades, but the bloodiest started in 1985. The roots of the war date back to July the 23rd, 1981, when Kazal Taoka, who you'll remember from entry number 8, died of natural causes. The person who would have assumed the position as boss was Kanichi Yamamoto, who was the second in command. However, when Taoka died, Yamamoto was in prison, so the lieutenants decided to wait until he got out of prison, and then he would lead the gang. But then Yamamoto died from liver failure in prison on February the 4th, 1982. With the two heads of the gang dead, the lieutenants voted on who would take the leadership. They elected Mashisha Takanaka. However, like many elections, not everyone was happy with the results. In this case, it was a man named Hiroshi Yamamoto. Hiroshi Yamamoto broke away Away from the Yamaguchi Gumi and formed his own group, Ichiwa Kai. They kickstarted the war by shooting to death Takenaka and two prominent members of the Yamaguchi Gumi while they were in an elevator. This led to more shootings, which are incredibly rare in Japan because of strict gun laws as well as bombings over the next four years. Things got so bad that Japanese newspapers kept a scorecard of the dead and the injured. The war was eventually won by Yamaguchi Gumi, who had many more soldiers. By the time the war was over, 36 people were dead and scores more were injured. Once the war came to an end, the members of Yamaguchi Gumi elected Yoshinori Watanabe, aka Mr. Gorilla, to be their leader in 1989. Watanabe was considered a strong and intelligent leader, growing membership and profits, but he resigned, or was forced to resign in 2005, as public heat increased on the Yakuza. The current boss of Yamaguchi Gumi is Kanichi Shinoda. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also over there on the right, a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And as always, thank you for watching.